This is Perry's Theory of Intellectual and Ethical Development. My name is Erin. My name is Deshaun. My name is Maya. And my name is Jada. To begin, Perry's Theory of Intellectual and Ethical Development was created by William G. Perry, Jr. Perry was working at Harvard University where he served as Bureau of Study Counsel. Perry and his colleagues drew a lot of their work from Piaget and Kohlberg and their original studies surrounding cognitive development. Perry's theory focused on how students understand and make effective meaning of their experiences. About the theory. This theory was developed in 1968 at Harvard University using a sample completely comprised of male students that attended Harvard. In this theory, he uses nine positions instead of stages. And he believes that the development occurs between stages and on a continuum. Perry chose positions over stages for three reasons. One is because position makes no assumption about duration. Number two, as individuals may demonstrate some range and structures at any given time. And three, is position is consistent with the point of view individuals use as a lens to examine the world in general. The study was replicated in 1971 and again in 1979 using female subjects from Radcliffe University to diversify the study. Key concepts. This theory talks about four concepts. The positions that we mentioned earlier are encompassed individually in each one of these concepts as its own position. The first is du dualism. Dichotomous thinking, viewing the world as right and wrong and only listening to authorities, not necessarily having an inner voice to guide your actions. Multiplicity, beginning to think for self and trust your inner voice. The landmark of this stage is problems being categorized as solvable or not yet knowing the answer to the problem. Relativism. Problems must be viewed within context and everything must be evalu evaluated based on that context. And the final one is commitment. Accepting uncertainty as a part of life. Perry's theory is a canonical theory because it is based off of a general body of knowledge and is still used to continually research and develop information surrounding the topic of intellectual and ethical development. Now we're going to discuss a little bit more about deconstruction and what it means to take apart the theory of Perry's theory of intellectual development and ethical development as well. So as we start the process of deconstruction of Perry's theory, it's important to acknowledge one of the major components of deconstruction, which it falls under the critical social theory. One of those components is stocks of knowledge. Stocks of knowledge is the generalized assumptions that people tend to have in regards to normal, what is qualified as normal anyway, um, theories. And so one of the assumptions that is made through Perry's theory is the assumption that all college students move through these positions of intellectual and ethical development in a linear fashion, that it goes from dualism to multiplicity to relativism to commitment in relativ relativism in the same similar fashion, and that there is no any other prior prioritizing way to do so, it, that everyone progresses in a linear fashion. There's also the assumption that all college environments are suitable um, environments in terms of being able to provide students the ability to, to start questioning and even uh, um, taking a critical look in terms of how they have their own personal beliefs and those beliefs of others to pr progress into the intellectual and development stages. All right, so one of the first components of deconstruction is attaining to ideological critique, which is just trying to understand the general background that Perry based most of his ideological facets of the theory around. So to go into the critique, one of the major assumptions that is made uh, is surrounding sort of the background of how the theory can apply to students. And one of those major assumptions is that all college students undergo intellectual and ethical development the exact same way, and there is no difference of regard without regard for identity. So one of the big things is that in his study, he mainly applied it to Harvard male students of the 1960s, which is around the time that the theory came to be. So there is not much else to apply the theory to. So it makes a generalized assumption that everyone 
intellectually and ethically develops the exact same way as these Harvard male students. There's also the, the assumption that the college environment contains a diverse enough population to begin the questioning process, which by this is just sort of allowing students the ability to not take a hard look at their own personal beliefs, but also be challenged and being offered an environment to encounter different perspectives. One of the different ways that we sort of address this sort of notion is different colleges that have different populations of students, whether it be HBCUs or predominantly white institutions, but also taking into account institutions where there are, they are single gendered or they are just one population in private um, religious affiliated universities as well. And then another generalized assumption that is made constantly throughout Perry's theory is the assumption that intellectual development is the exact same in every context without regard to how society is organized. So it is, he acknowledges in the beginning part of his ideological um, sort of like development into the theory that it's very much attained and applied to a capitalistic sort of country. And so it, we cannot make the assumption that just because our, everything is centered around the U.S. and how capitalism plays into here and how the students are able to develop intellectually um, and ethically as well, that this would also apply to a country that doesn't, uh, or a population of students that don't also prescribe to a capitalistic nature as well. All right, so the second part of deconstruction is commodification. And this takes a look at how a particular theory can make it very dehumanizing towards people that it is applied to, and but it also focuses on a sense of product, productivity or production and how that is more valued than the actual essence of the human person. So a big part of that, that Perry's theory of intellectual and ethical development plays off of is the assumption that there is no self-thought when using a dualistic position of intellectual and ethical development. And basically what that means is like there is students are not active agents in being able to construct their own reality in terms of their self-thought and in terms of like their intellectual and ethical development. And so it just seems as if students are meant to move along the positions of the theory itself, um, going from dualism, obviously, all the way into the end of it, to relativism and eventually commitment to rel relativism without taking into account different lifestyles, different backgrounds, or even just their individual way to think through how they are active agents in terms of being able to think think evidently and critically about their lifestyles and their beliefs. Another assumption that is made is that every college student is capable of the same intellectual development model. Perry very much constructed his theory to apply to a specific group of people and there's no account for how it would apply to students that have intellectual disabilities or students that do not function in the same way in terms of being able to develop intellectually and ethically in the same manner. And so it makes the assumption that people are commodities and sort of subject to the theory and it is meant to only apply to certain people that eventually feed back into a certain system of being able to provide a product at the end, which obviously if we're applying this to a collegiate setting, it's just being able to critically and um, ethically develop while they are in college and then afterwards being able to apply that new sense of knowledge to a job or any outside of um, body of knowledge outside of the collegiate setting. With regards to flow of power, William G. Perry's theory of intellectual and ethical development perpetuates the hegemonic norm that all students, at some point, believe that authority figures are good and have the right answers. This ignores circumstances in which individuals have deeply rooted conflict with authority figures. An example of this may be someone who grew up in a re region in which political unrest and conflict interferes with the safe day-to-day -day living. Additionally, Perry's theory assumes that educational authority figures have the knowledge and skills to teach students to become critical thinkers and move through the positions of intellectual and ethical development. Given that many current day higher education institution courses are in large group settings with hundreds of students, we must not assume that all students are getting the one-on-one -on -one education and attention necessary to promote development of meaning making. The same can be said for a student who is solely an online learner. Regarding willful blindness, Perry makes no mention of context while students are moving through the first three positions, 
dualism, multiplicity, and relativism. For example, the position could be different for a student when they are in the classroom versus when they are in church. Additionally, on a global scale, meaning making could differ for students at an institution in a collectivistic region of the world versus an individualistic region of the world. Although Perry acknowledged the following downfall in his study, it was also willfully blind that only white men at Harvard University were studied to develop the theory, leaving students of different genders, races, backgrounds, and higher education institutes unacknowledged. The varying lived experience of students who come from different backgrounds has the potential to impact the flow of intellectual development. In wrapping up the deconstruction section of Perry's theory of intellectual and ethical development, it is important to note that William G. Perry was a white male researcher and educator at Harvard University whose study was conducted in the late 1960s. Given that his work was not created using a critical approach, the theory may not reflect the intellectual development of more diverse groups of students who currently are in, he are in higher education institutions. Implications and Reconstruction In terms of next steps, research should be expanded to include more schools, women, people of color, and people of different social classes. There should also be more research conducted to include students with intellectual disabilities. Lastly, Nuffelkamp and Wittig's developmental instruction model could be used in operationalizing Perry's model. Their DI model includes structure, diversity, experiential learning, and personalism. These are our suggestions leading into reconstruction. The first is to diversify the research study to include different marginalized groups, such as women and people of color. The second, as for attending to power dynamics, there can be stated understandings of notable power dynamics involved in learning environments. And for our third, creating agency and acknowledging that individuals are active agents in their own intellectual development. That's all, folks. Thanks for listening to our TED Talk. Deuces!